So I, uh, since my specialty is in ethics, uh, I want to talk about uh, how things would be different if we looked at ethics in a secular way. Um, obviously, there's a lot of issues this raises. People often ask you something like, well, how can you even have ethics without God? Um, and there are questions about the foundations of ethics. Uh, I'm not going to go into them now, but if you want to ask questions about that, I'll be happy to attempt it. Although, obviously, that's a big topic. But I want to look really at the differences that make, because if we're talking about uh, why it's important to have a secular society, one of those questions is, well, what difference would it make if we really developed an ethics without religion to some of the things that matter to us and some of the things that we do? So I'm going to begin at the end of life and raise this question about what difference would it make to how we die and essentially the choices that we make at the time we die. I then want to look at other questions about uh, the views of what sometimes called the sanctity of human life, which I think is fundamentally a religious conception, and how we might move away from that. And then from there, I do want to make uh, some comments about how a secular ethic might look at uh, our relations with animals, uh, the moral status of animals, because I think that is very different too, but I'm very conscious that when I talk to people who are secular, who are uh, atheists or, or anyway uh, non-theists, that often I don't think they fully assimilated that point of what understanding the way we exist with animals, how that would be different if we truly freed ourselves from uh, the vestiges of religious belief that still affect our society. So with that preamble, let me try and move through some of this. and. Uh, um, well, let's move through some of this if my next slide will come. It's not too great. Just a second. Okay, there we go. So, um, I don't want to make this uh, particularly an exercise in attacking our president, but he does make a useful figure for epitomizing some positions that those who are secular in their orientation might want to disagree with. Now, this is an interesting statement here, and this is a statement which, um, on some issues at least, um, one could agree with. I wouldn't agree with it on all issues. I think uh, there are cases where uh, maybe uh, consumers need some protection, uh, but uh, in general I think it's a good idea to say that we should allow individuals the maximum freedom to make their own decisions. So when the president said this in the president, sorry, when the then governor of Texas said this in the uh, presidential debates in October 2000, I think that was heartening uh, for a number of different issues. Uh, among those issues was the question of physician-assisted suicide, um, which, as many of you will know, uh, had existed already for some years in the state of Oregon, having been twice supported by the citizens of Oregon in referenda. Twice because uh, opponents of, of physician-assisted suicide managed to drag it back in the courts, um, which then ordered a second round which uh, supported it by an even larger majority than the first time around. Um, so that people, citizens of Oregon, of Oregon, no doubt would have thought that was a good uh, omen for protecting their uh, laws that they approved of. However, once he got into office a year later, we find that his Attorney General, John Ashcroft, whom you will remember, but not regret the passing on, I suppose, too much, um, <laughs> said that uh, we, the President believes we must value life and promote a culture that respects the sanctity of life at all its stages and therefore opposes physician-assisted suicide. And the government therefore tried, uh, the administration tried, on really what was a very flimsy legal pretext to have Oregon's physician-assisted suicide, suicide law struck down. Uh, fortunately, he was not successful in that um, and that law continues to exist. But this is an example, I think, of something which, in a secular society, we would be much readier to support. Um, I'm not saying that all opposition to physician-assisted suicide comes from religious people. There are some people who may fear that it will open up uh, possibilities of abuse or of a slippery slope or something of that sort. But I think that these fears are actually unwarranted and don't rest on any strong evidential basis. And the experience of Oregon 
certainly suggests that uh, over the last, I think uh, maybe it's nine years now, uh, that they've had that law. Um, and I would say the experience of the Netherlands, which has had uh, uh, voluntary euthanasia for much longer, uh, points in the same direction. And that's why uh, the law in the Netherlands was followed by the, the neighboring state of the Netherlands, Belgium, um, which adopted a similar law uh, two or three years ago. Um, I think most people do want to be able to decide when they've had enough, if they're terminally ill or incurably ill, um, they're the best judge of their quality of life. And I believe uh, on those grounds that uh, it's a reasonable thing. In fact, it, it seems to be supported by the majority of people in this country, as polls consistently show, and indeed in, in most countries in the world. Um, there is a clear majority in favor of physician-assisted suicide, or in some cases, voluntary euthanasia as well. Yet, it rarely makes it through the political process. And in Oregon, for example, it was only because Oregon has the possibility of citizens-initiated referenda that it's happened. It's, it's never gone through a, a legislature in this country. And the reason for that, I think, is that it's vociferously opposed by religious groups, particularly the Catholic Church, which put a lot of money into trying to defeat the uh, two referenda in, in Oregon, uh, much more money than was spent by the advocates of the uh, proposal. Um, uh, but, but people fear um, a minority who will be really committed to this issue. So that if you, you may have 70% or even 75% of some polls suggest in support of it, but if those are people who are not going to change their vote by whether or not you support this issue, but there's 25% or even 15% that will change their vote contingent on how you vote on this issue, then legislators are going to be very reluctant to support it. And that, I think, is the problem with uh, uh, religious groups which tend to take uh, an absolutist stance on this because they see it as uh, taking human life, as indeed it is, and as something, therefore, that's prohibited by the commandments or uh, by general teachings about the sanctity of human beings. Uh, so that's, that's one issue where I think we can genuinely feel that religion restricts us, prevents us making an important decision about our lives that many of us at least would want to be able to control, would want to be able to decide if it comes down to that issue. And so uh, it's not enough to simply say, well, you know, why do we bother about religion? Why don't we let people who are religious practice their religion as they wish? and we'll practice our atheism as we wish. Uh, well, it's not as simple as that. If they are trying to dictate to us about matters like this, then it's obvious that it's important, actually, for us to say, no, hey, wait a minute, uh, you don't really have any basis for the claims that you're making, um, and, and therefore, uh, you, and, you, know, you shouldn't be interfering in our lives. You should be getting out of our lives where what you're doing is basing your interference on your religious belief. Okay, so that's uh, one, the first of these issues. Let me uh, go on to issues that are not about voluntary euthanasia, but are about other life and death decisions. I'm sure most of you will remember the fast that we had really in this country over the case of, of Terry Scarbo uh, a year or two back, uh, where we actually had uh, Congress recalled uh, during a recess and the President flown back uh, from his ranch to Washington to sign into law a bill that was uh, supposed to save uh, Terry Scargo's life or to at least give, uh, uh, put it back in the courts for another round of judicial decision. Um, again, there's no doubt that this was influenced by religious belief that uh, was so fixated on the sanctity of life that um, although, I mean, there was some debate about exactly what Terry Skyvo's cognitive state was, whether she was conscious uh, or not, um, I think it, you know, her husband always uh, said that she was clearly not. Most people who actually examined her said she was not. There was some video that went around on TV that maybe suggested she was, but of course if you take uh, 24 hours of video, it's not too hard to cut a few seconds that make someone look as if uh, their eyes are following someone else's face. Um, 
And uh, the autopsy uh, after she died, I think, made it clear that her brain was so badly damaged that she could not have had consciousness. But um, uh, again, it's, it's the distorted priorities, I think, that flow from a religious belief in the absolute sanctity of life that lead to this uh, really enormous waste of taxpayers' money that was involved in this case. And interestingly, it seems that, that uh, the religious right actually overplayed its hand in that particular case because the polls subsequently showed that the public did not approve of this. They would rather just let the courts decide uh, whether it's the husband or the, or the parents who should be able to make the decision. Um, the courts, on acting on precedent there, would go for the husband. And that's really as far as anyone else, I think, wanted to go with that. But there are issues here about um, the idea of how we value human life and why we value human life. Let me move on to another of, of these issues. Now, um, this is uh, decisions made in the Netherlands uh, about euthanasia, which is actually non-voluntary because it's dealing with severely disabled infants. Um, uh, it's, of course, done with the consent of the parents of the infants, so in that sense there is a voluntary consent, but the infants clearly can't consent for themselves. This is an issue that I've uh, written about on a number of occasions over the years, and which uh, caused a lot of opposition and protest when I was first appointed to uh, the Chair of Bioethics at Princeton University in uh, 1999. Um, but let's just, I don't want to go into all of that background now, we can talk about it more again in, in question time if you wish. Um, but I just want to make a, a point here about, uh, you know, when this, uh, the fact that physicians in the Netherlands were carrying out active euthanasia on a very small number of very severely disabled infants. Uh, this was published in the New England Medical Journal. Um, a, a major journal in this country, and caused a lot of criticism of the Netherlands, again, uh, largely from people with a, a religious uh, sanctity of life kind of view. Uh, um, although, as you see here, it was uh, 22 cases over seven years, so it was a very small number of cases. Obviously, the physicians were being very selective in only carrying this out for uh, those infants with the most hopeless prognosis. Uh, who they felt were suffering unbearably, and um, of course with, with the consent of the parents. Uh, and I want you to, to uh, contrast that situation where people got very upset about this with this situation, uh, the infant mortality rates in this country. If you're really seriously interested in saving infant life, then you would think your first priority would be to actually reduce the really quite appalling rate of infant mortality in this country um, for a wealthy developed nation. It's actually worse. There's a higher infant mortality in this country than there is in Cuba, uh, a very poor nation. And I'm not quoting communist propaganda here. I'm quoting the CIA World Factbook. Um, so uh, you know, that's, uh, and then if you compare that with the Netherlands, which has a somewhat better rate again, as I say here, if the US had a rate similar to that of the Netherlands, there would be about 6,000 fewer infant deaths every year. And these are infants whose parents want them to live because they think they have good prospects, and most of them do. So surely that's a lot more important than worrying about whether there's a very small number of cases where physicians and parents coming together to consult decide that the infant's prospects are so bad that it's really better that the infant should die. And never mind about getting to uh, rates like those of Sweden, where we would be, you know, um, tens of thousands of infant lives would be, would be saved. And of course, there is more that we can do about that. I mean, part of this is because we have such a crazy healthcare system that there are a lot of people who are uninsured, and there are a lot of people um, who, even though they're on uh, uh, Medicaid, um, are not getting uh, really uh, any sort of quality care. And we could do a lot better with that. We could do a lot, of, lot better with. Um, uh, prenatal sort of uh, uh, care that would reduce the number of women who have premature births and as a result whose, um, whose babies die uh, in infancy. And here's another way if we were concerned about saving human life I think that we would get a bit of a better perspective on and that is the amount of totally unnecessary human deaths that are occurring all over the world 
um, essentially from preventable diseases. So again, when you when you people who are concerned about euthanasia or concerned for that matter about abortion, which I'm going to come to in a moment, um, I think they would if they really were genuinely concerned about saving the lives of children, they should be focused on how much more we could do to provide some basic health care, um, some decent nutrition, perhaps uh, protection against malaria like um, bed nets uh, for other countries, for some of the poorest countries in the world, where UNICEF tells us about 10 million children are dying preventable deaths every year, and that comes out to something like 27,000 a day. I mean, think about that. Think about the, the great tragedy that occurred on September 11th, just uh, you can see the view to the, uh, to the south of us there. Uh, think how bad that was. We mark that as a day of national tragedy, but then think that nearly 10 times as many, nine times as many innocent people also died on that day from preventable causes, though not in such a dramatic fashion that television cameras could capture and repeat endlessly. And we didn't do anything about that. And another 10 times, nine times as many died the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and every day since. And we're still doing very, very little about it. This is actually what we're doing, if you want the figures, um, this is from the uh, OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development website, and it's about foreign aid. The, the crucial figure is, is the second bottom line here. This stands for ODA, Official Development Assistance, as a percentage of gross national income, and it's 0 0.22. I will give Bush some credit for having raised that figure a little bit. But 0 0.22 means, to put it in ordinary terms, for every $100 this country earns, we give 22 cents in foreign aid. It's not very much, is it? And a lot of countries do a lot better. In fact, the Netherlands do a lot better. They give about 80 cents. Still not that great, I don't think. But about four times as much as this country. So again, uh, although they've legalized voluntary euthanasia, although they allow doctors uh, uh, in rare circumstances to end the lives of uh, infants with hopeless prospects and they don't prosecute them, they save far more lives by being more generous in their foreign aid than we are. And incidentally, even this figure is misleading in terms of saving the lives of the poorest people because uh, you want to know who the, the three f largest recipients of US development aid are at the moment? They're firstly Iraq, secondly Afghanistan, thirdly Egypt. Now, Afghanistan actually is a very poor country, but it's not because of that that it's second on the list. The other two are not the poorest countries in the world, but they are countries of geopolitical significance to us in terms of protecting our interests. The really poor countries, the uh, sub-Saharan African countries, come far further down on the list. Uh, there's actually the figures I, I have there. So you see Iraq actually is, um, is, is by far the largest, is dominating seven times as much as Afghanistan and uh, uh, really 14 times as much almost as, as the first poor, really poor country you get to uh, when you get down to Sudan or, or Ethiopia. So that's uh, uh, another uh, crucial issue where I think if we really you know, got away from a religious ethic and stopped uh, some of this discussion about uh, the, the sanctity of life and, and really looked at trying to do the best for people who want to live around the world and who want their children to live, we would have very different policies. Let me move uh, quickly now through this question of the status of uh, embryos and fetuses. Um, here's some remarks from the President's speech in August 2001. It was actually his first national televised address after assuming the presidency. It, of course, got rather submerged in the events of a month later. Um, but he made this speech about whether we should allow embryos to be destroyed for stem cell research. And he said, well, we're not going to allow federal funds to be used if the embryos are being destroyed after the date of my speech. So if there were stem cell lines around that had, from embryos that had been destroyed, okay, nothing could be done about that, but no more, basically, he was saying. But I want to look at the reasoning here in this sentence. His question was, first, are these frozen embryos human life and therefore something precious and to be protected? 
Now, I think that that's actually not the right question to ask, although many people do, including secular people, think that the abortion debate and the embryo use debate should be about the question, when does human life begin? I don't think it should be about that question at all. I'm quite happy to say that what we have here is human life, and, and you know, this, if this is a, a, a blastocyst, a human embryo, it's definitely human in the sense that it's a member of the species Homo sapien, and it's alive, if it's still developing, still growing, it's not being destroyed. So I don't think that's the issue, and I think the reason we focus on that is a vestige of this religious view that human beings are special because they alone are made in the image of God, or perhaps because they alone have an immortal soul. And I think that's the kind of mistake that's going on, even if the argument is seems to be put in secular terms, as Bush, at least part, for part of this speech, he did actually have some religious references as well, but for part of the speech seemed to be arguing in secular terms. But I think this is a, a mistake. So here's the way this standard argument often goes. It says, well, the embryo or fetus is an innocent human being, and it's always wrong to kill an innocent human being. We all know that, don't we? Um, and therefore, it's always wrong to kill an embryo or fetus. Now, um, I think that this actually, this argument plays on an ambiguity in the notion of uh, human being. Um, it can be taken two ways. And we have to ask, this is the important moral question we should be asking. What is it that gives a being moral status? Is it being a member of the species Homo sapien? Or is it something else, like self-awareness, being able to think about your life in a biographical way, being able to plan ahead? What I would say, and I, this is, I didn't invent this term here for this usage, what I would say, being a person, that can be traced back, actually, to uh, for, th for really a couple of thousand years, that discussion of the term person, even actually in early Christian theology, the idea of a person not being the same as a human being, because those theologians who spent their time speculating about the doctrine of the Trinity had to develop a notion of the person, because the Trinity in Christian doctrine is uh, that God is three persons in one. Well, only one of those three persons, if you believe this nonsense, is actually a human being. So they have to be persons who are not human beings. And, and I think one way of talking about this is, well, a person is a being with certain mental qualities. That specific definition I've got here really goes back to the 17th century uh, English philosopher John Locke. So let's amend the argument uh, in a couple of different ways to see how it might play out. Let's suppose we write in this idea that what's important is being a member of the species Homo sapien. Okay. Well, then the first premise is clearly true. But there's the second premise now on this version. And there's the conclusion which will follow if we grant both premises. But should we grant both premises? I think that that premise is one we should now reject. Because that's the premise that depends on the idea that just being a member of a species is really important. And when you look at that, I don't see why just biological species membership should convey any moral status at all in itself. And I think people only believe it does because of this relic of the Christian view that if you're a member of the species Homo sapien, you're made in the image of God, you have an immortal soul, uh, and so on. Um, and that's, I think, where that comes from. But otherwise, you know, why species? Why should species be important? I mean, if you were ET or something, some friendly alien, surely your life would still have value. And maybe, as we'll come to, even if you're a non-human animal, your life might have some value. So here's another version then that takes that account. It says, okay, then we, we write the argument this way. It would still follow if the premises were true. But now the first premise is clearly not true, right? That premise is clearly not true. Um, the embryo or fetus is obviously not an innocent person. It's not self-aware, anything like that. Not capable of thinking of itself as living a life. Doesn't have any plans for the future that you cut off if you end its life. And that's what seems to me to be most seriously wrong. If you like, the, the, the differential wrong that comes from killing beings like us, all of us are persons, at least if you're following this talk, you're certainly a person. Um, and uh, um, uh, the differential wrong in killing someone like us rather than killing, let's say, an animal which may not have this capacity. And some animals, I would guess, do not, although some of them may. So that's what I think is wrong in either version. Okay, 
Now let me still, I've got just uh, about five minutes left, so let me just quickly say something about this last topic, which I think is a really important one that we should be more focused on, because what we're talking about is, uh, you know, people tend to think, well, why are you talking about animals, you know, aren't issues about human beings more important? I think that itself is already a reflection of the bias that we have and we've inherited from this Christian, basically, or Judeo-Christian view. Um, it's not everywhere in all religions. I think a Buddhist, for example, or perhaps even a Hindu would not have quite the same view. But we certainly have it in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, because it has this idea of, of humans being created by God after the other animals were created, created, created in God's image. Um, and also that grant of dominion that you're familiar with, you know. God gave man dominion over the other creatures. So most Christians interpreted that as saying, well, that means it's okay, we can do what we like with them, it doesn't really matter. And you see this here quoted from uh, Thomas Aquinas, Saint Thomas Aquinas, if you're a believing uh, Catholic, um, who was the most influential philosopher in the Catholic tradition uh, for at least 1800 years. Uh, well, no, no, that's not quite true because he was only in 1300, but I guess, you know, started to dominate uh, Catholic philosophy from his own time in the 13th century um, until the 18th or, or 19th century. And even today, he's still enormously influential in Catholic teachings. And this is really what he says, quite literally. It just doesn't matter how you behave to animals because God has given us dominion over them. And he also adds, and they don't share with us what he calls the communion of everlasting life. So he really thinks that if somebody were to torture an animal slowly and cause it excruciating agony just for the fun of it, that really would not matter because the pain of the animal just doesn't matter. He adds just one, one slightly softening comment, and that is, well, we don't want people to be needlessly, wantonly cruel because then they might become cruel to humans, and that would be bad. But it's only like, you know, it's, it, it could be practiced for doing something that is bad. It's not that it's bad to slowly torture animals to death. It's not that it's really bad in itself, except that it, it, you know, it might lead you to do things that, that genuinely are bad. It's that gulf between humans and animals that Christians place that has had this enormous influence on Christian teaching for many centuries. So much so that when in the 19th century uh, there was an attempt to establish a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals in the Vatican territories, the territories ruled by the Pope, uh, the Pope at the time said, no, we're not going to allow that to be established because it would give people the false idea that humans have duties to animals. So um, that's what you get out of uh, uh, Christian teaching, and I think that's been influential. Even philosophers who are not, who are not Christians but are not theologians and not saints, Protestants here, we have Immanuel Kant, Protestant Christian, took very much the same view, really, as Aquinas, although he was writing 500 years uh, later or something like that. Um, he also thought we have no direct duties to animals. They're just there merely as a means to an end. That end is man. Um, I don't think you can defend that in, even in terms of Kant's own philosophy. And I'm pleased to be able to say that the leading Kantian philosopher in the United States today, uh, Professor Christine Korsgaard at Harvard, agrees with this view. She thinks Kant got this wrong and actually made a, a, an error in his reasoning, although she's a, she supports his views on most issues, but not on this point. So the interesting thing is what's that, where that's led us, where this simple idea that animals are there as a means, and the means is us, have simply led us over recent years to apply our technology to using animals for our own ends, merely as items of property, to do as we like with. And here are just quickly a few instances of this. You probably, a lot of you know about veal production. As, uh, here's a photo of it. Veal calves basically can find for their fairly short lives without being able to move or turn around in these narrow stalls so that they don't develop unpalatable muscle or uh, eat grass which would turn their meat a darker color. And a lot of people recently, a lot of Americans have turned away from veal because of that, and that's good. But um, it's not so hard to turn away from veal, uh, and veal was always a relatively small form of intensive farming. And a lot of the other things that people have not turned away from are much uh, larger. So here's, uh, you know, the by far the most numerous animal 
raised and slaughtered for food in this country is the chicken, which, whatever we might think about chickens, is still a sentient being capable of suffering and not suited by its nature, even with all the breeding that we've had, to live in these sorts of conditions. Uh, 20,000 birds in a single shed crammed together like this uh, is, causes them all sorts of stress and they are not individuals at all. There's no uh, care for them as individuals uh, because they're so cheap, um, because you're just talking about uh, a commodity here that's to be produced at the cheapest possible uh, price. And they've been bred to grow so fast that sometimes their legs will break, the bones are not mature enough, and they will just collapse on the floor and die of hunger or, starve or, or dehydration because they can't get to food or water anymore. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up. These are how most of America's turkeys are produced. Very similar conditions um, to, the, uh, to the broiler chickens that you saw. Uh, with the additional wrinkle that they're all the result of artificial insemination, incidentally. Uh, you might like to bring that up over your Thanksgiving dinner. We, 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 bred, we bred the standard turkey with such big breasts uh, that they can't mate. And every one of these turkeys is the result of uh, some worker, usually very poorly paid uh, immigrant workers, um, grabbing male turkeys and masturbating them and collecting the semen and then someone else grabbing female turkeys and flipping them over and opening them up and someone injecting the semen into it. Not a pleasant process either. Uh, pigs, these are the breeding sows that are confined pretty much like veal calves. Um, if any of you are from California, by the way, there's going to be a referendum to ban uh, this and some of the other conditions. Uh, there's attempts to gather signatures for it for the 2008 election, so I'd urge you to support that. More sows. Uh, this is after the sow is given birth. She's also still trapped, more or less, by this stall. Uh, there's the breeding pigs. They're obviously lively and intelligent animals if they can get a chance to be so, but locked indoors in sheds all the time, they have no chances. And these are your egg producing hens um, in wire cages, uh, generally also extremely crowded. So this I think is the legacy of uh, the Christian or the Judeo-Christian attitude to animals, which fails to take account of the fact that they're just other beings. You know, the, the myth that God created us last and gave us dominion over it uh, just is a way of blinding ourselves to what we, at least since Darwin, have, have understood, that we just evolved from them and from common ancestors. They are living, were living their own lives before we captured them and domesticated them. And uh, uh, they have as much of a claim to enjoy their lives and to live those lives out fully um, as we do. And I don't think that we have any uh, right to, to deprive them of it. So to contrast a secular philosopher with the Christian ones I gave you before, here's Jeremy Bentham, the founding father of utilitarians, utilitarianism, asking what I think is clearly the right question. It, it's not about can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? For, at least for most of what we do. Maybe not exactly for this question of killing, when if we really could give them good lives and kill them painlessly, maybe we could debate that, whether that would you know, certainly make things a lot better. Um, but at least for the sorts of things that I've just shown you, this must be the crucial question, because the answer we know is yes, they can suffer and they do suffer in the way that we're rearing them, uh, and we don't need to do it, incidentally. It's not a way of producing more food at all. It's a way of wasting food, because we have to feed them food to uh, get them to grow like that, and we waste most of the food value in doing so. So, uh, I would take rather this position, that we should give equal consideration to similar interests, and at least where we're talking about pain and suffering, those experiences can be similar across species. Now, when we're talking about painless killing, as I said, well, death may be a greater loss if you're aware of your own existence, you can plan for the future, then killing you against your will deprives you of something that other beings can't really appreciate. So maybe, you know, that is a difference because we're not talking about similar interests there. But uh, the first part, the part about pain and suffering and distress, is enough, I think, to radically shift our views about animals. And that, surely, I think, is, is what we should be doing if we really rethink our ethics about animals in a way that is truly free of the prejudices of the religious worldview that says there's this enormous gulf between animals and humans because we're God's creation in this special way, and they are not. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Professor Singer. I think we have time for uh, two, perhaps three very brief questions, if you please. Uh, perhaps we'll do two from this room and then one from the overflow room. Uh, uh, so first, on, on, on uh, my left. Yeah, the, all the stuff at the beginning about the problems of uh, the way this religious uh, community is against abortion and, and uh, contraception and everything, it all comes down to fundamentally all the fundamentalist religions in, of every sort are in the business of controlling female behavior and in particular female sexuality, primarily for the benefit of the males knowing paternity. And uh, I think that is the core of why it's so hard to break away from this and why they don't really care about human life and, and why there's all those uh, uh, contradictions. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that that's part of the story, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, but you know, clearly that's not what they're saying, so I think we have to tackle the arguments as they present them, take them at face value, uh, which is what I tried to do today, and show that they don't stand up even as they presented them. Uh, Thank we're you. taking one from here, Nick? Oh, yeah, sorry, you please. Um, there is a movement towards, should we support farms that do free range raising of chickens? Buffalo, etc. I just want your feelings about that. Yes, I mean, if we're talking about a choice between what I showed you and a free-range, grass-fed, pasture-based farm, absolutely, you know, you should support that as well. I do want to add, you don't really need to do either. You can live a healthy, uh, environmentally highly sus sustainable, eco-friendly life. As uh, a vegetarian or as a vegan, uh, that's an option that I would uh, urge many of you to consider. But you know, if 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 you're simply not going to go there, then definitely the least you can do is get away from factory farming and go to somewhere where animals at least can have halfway decent lives. And is there a question from the voice in the sky? Uh, indeed, there is. Uh, Mr. Singer, you describe chickens as sentient beings. What is your definition of sentience, and what is the difference between a chicken and a rock that gives it such a, uh, a descriptor? Yeah, absolutely. I do describe chickens as, as sentient beings. Um, what is the difference is that uh, the chicken has a complex nervous system, which uh, anatomically is quite similar to ours. Uh, it leads to a centralized brain, as ours does. And of course, the chicken behaves in certain ways when you inflict uh, what would be pain on it if, if you did to us, for example, if you, uh, say, cut off its beak with a, with a hot blade, which incidentally is standardly done to all of those egg-laying hens, because otherwise in that confined cage they would peck each other to death, so the uh, ends of their beaks are seared off with a hot blade, and, and that's not like cutting your fingernails, they have a lot of nerves in their beaks because that's how they relate to the world and their environment, and, and they show pain behaviour, and it affects them. Uh, so I think it's clear that they can feel pain when rocks cannot. And after all, in evolutionary terms, if we believe that we've evolved from common ancestors, it would be kind of strange, wouldn't it, if we've evolved a nervous system with a centralized brain, they've evolved a nervous system with a centralized brain, presumably we've come from a common ancestor who had a nervous system with a centralized brain. Uh, pain serves an evolutionary purpose in us, pain serves an evolutionary purpose in them, in getting them away from threatening or dangerous situations. It would be kind of strange if somehow they'd taken completely different paths so that they're just kind of clever robots and we're ones who actually have feelings. I'm very sorry we have to cut off uh, question and answers now. Uh, 